Right, well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this event of bringing the Polish Cyclometer back to life, hosted by King's College. So a bit of housekeeping first. This is an online event in which we will start by giving a presentation and this will be followed by a demonstration of the cyclometer and we'll end the event with a question and answer session. Okay, so now for some um, introductions. I'm Tim Flack. I'm a member of the engineering department at Cambridge and a fellow at King's College. Uh, following a visit to Bletchley Park many years ago, I became fascinated by everything related to the breaking of Enigma. Uh, primarily, I think, because of the link back to King's College via Alan Turing. And thus commenced a series of projects, which are all fourth year engineering projects, the most recent of which resulted in the recreation of the first electromechanical device developed to regularly break the Enigma, uh, which was called the Polish Cyclometer. And so this was a fourth year engineering project, but the project owes its success to a number of collaborations. And so I need to mention a few of those. Um, Lorraine Heaton in the development office to help with funding and to provide extra funding for Hal Evans, um, who was the fourth year project student on the uh, cyclometer project, but also the engineering department and in particular their workshop staff. Um, other suppliers of bespoke engineering materials and products helped out. Um, but last but not least, a highly enthusiastic and dedicated project student. And on that note, I'd like to pass you on to my co-presenter, Hal Evans, to introduce himself. Thank you very much, Tim. So hello, everyone. I'm Hal Evans. Uh, and as Tim was saying, I, I study engineering at Cambridge, uh, specialised in mechanical engineering. Um, so while in my master's year, I, as Tim was saying, um, he was offering a project on, on the Polish cyclometer. And given my broad range of interest from, from mathematics to, to engineering to history and art, the cyclometer project for me was perfect. After graduating, I spent several months working full time on the cyclometer on the replica to ensure that it was completed. And that was made possible from the generous funding from King's College. In this time, I spent many hours fabricating parts of the cyclometer. And as a result, a large portion of my time was spent in the Cambridge University Engineering Department workshops. I really can't emphasize enough the role of the workshop staff in this. Their expertise and knowledge was phenomenal and they spent many hours helping me with the manufacture. I certainly have some very fond memories of the workshop. And I'm glad to say that I think some of the uh, workshop staff are, are here today to listen to the talk. It's personal to this point to say that I'd like to dedicate this talk in memory of Steve Robinson, who sadly died earlier this year. Steve was a member of the workshop and kindly spent many hours helping me in the replica's manufacture. And as a result, the party played will always be remembered. I'd like to hand back to Tim to kick us off with the format and overview of the talk. Thank you very much, Hal. Okay, so I'm going to share some PowerPoint slides now. Okay, so this talk is all about bringing the Polish cyclometer back to life. Um, as a brief overview, I'll talk about the historical background to the cyclometer. And then I'm gonna hand over to Hal, who will talk about the purpose of the cyclometer, um, how it was operated, and then he'll focus more on the work he did in the course of his fourth year project and in the following summer in the internship, uh, where he completed the project, leading to the manufacture of the world's first replica cyclometer. Um, after Hal's spoken, I will then come back to me I've got the cyclometer at home with me and I'll um, give a online demonstration of the cyclometer in action. And then at the end, you'll have the opportunity. You'll have submitted some questions, we hope, and we'll have a go at answering them. So that's the plan. Um, so in terms of the historical background, the starting point is the Enigma machine that was used by the uh, German command to encrypt radio communications. Radio communications are incredibly insecure. Anyone can intercept and listen to radio communications. And so when you need to 
send messages that you don't want other people to listen into, um, the main strategy is to encrypt those messages first. And that's what the Enigma achieved. The Enigma was a state-of-the-art uh, encryption device in the 1930s. It was initially invented for commercial transactions, things like banking and business and so on. Um, and the Germans adopted it and then modified it to make it even more secure. And what you see on the figure on the left is a photograph of a replica military enigma. So in terms of what the enigma did, when, the, um, when a message, message was to be sent, the enigma operator would have the plain text, that's the, the actual message you're sending, and then they would type it into the enigma keyboard and out of the enigma emerged the cipher text, the scrambled up uh, message. And so what the Enigma did was um, the, the keyboard was connected via a plug board, which could transpose pairs of letters. And then the plug board went to what's known as the input commutator, which fed the signal through a series of three rotors. Each of these rotors would scramble uh, letters that, between input and output into a, a, the thing called the reflector here. And the signals would make their way back through the three rotors, back through the input commutator, back through the plug board and eventually to the light, the, the lamp board where a lamp would light up. And the thing uh, about the Enigma was that the lamp that lit up was always different to the letter that was being enciphered. That was in some ways an advantage, but in other ways a disadvantage of the Enigma. It was one key piece of information that those trying to decrypt and break into the Enigma knew that a letter could never be enciphered onto itself. Now, the other key point about the Enigma is that every time a key was pressed on the keyboard, the right hand rotor, uh, also known as the fast rotor, would rotate through 126th of a revolution. And so what that meant is that with every key press, the mapping between the input letter and the output letter would change. So if you typed in a whole sequences of one letter, let's say the letter A, at every key press of the letter A, that would result in a different uh, lamp being lit up. So what the Enigma operator would do was he'd type in the plain text and make a note of the corresponding lamps that lit up. That was the cipher text. He'd then hand that on to the Morse code operator who would then transmit the uh, message over the radio waves. And it didn't matter if anyone listened in or not, so they thought. Um, they wouldn't be, the, the Germans believe that the Enigma was completely secure and no one could ever break into it. So in terms of the security of the Enigma, um, what you've got is these three different rotors that can be put in any one of three times two times one equals six orders. Um, each of the rotors can be put into one of 26 different starting positions. Um, then there were things called the rings that affected when the rotors caused each other to move on one notch. So in the end, if once the fast rotor had gone through one entire revolution, it would cause the middle rotor to jog on by one increment and so on. Um, so that gave 26 cubes times 26 squared times six. And then the, what, the thing that the Germans did that they thought made the Enigma absolutely unbreakable was at this plug board. And that's the thing that gives the Enigma lots and lots of ways to reconfigure it. So that's the background. And the job of the Polish Cypher Bureau, as it was constituted in the early 1930s, was to somehow break into this machine, the military Enigma. And their only uh, information was a lot of intercepted uh, ciphertext messages to enable them to achieve that. So in this slide, you can see the head of the Cypher Bureau, Marian Rejewski. Um, this is Henrik Zagalski, and this is Jerza Ruski. And between the three of them, they developed a whole series of methods for breaking uh, the Enigma. So breaking the Enigma required two main feats to be carried out. The first one was to deduce the nature of the hardware platform that does the encryption. That is, how were the Enigma rotors wired up? How was the reflector wired up? How was the input commutator wired up? 
this is a formidable task and is widely regarded as the greatest feat of um, modern cryptography was figuring out the basic uh, how the enigma uh, was wired up and what it enabled um, them to do once they'd achieved that was to have a number of replica enigmas built at a nearby factory which then assisted in them in the, in the daily task of listening in and decrypting all the German communications. How they did it? Well, these were three um, very talented mathematicians and they used a branch of pure maths, uh, which had to that point not really found applications um, called permutation theory. That combined with a lot of intercepted messages some security issues in the messaging methods that were used by the Germans, and Hal will explain all that in his part of the talk, combined with some certain amount of luck, guesswork, and also uh, an input, some input from um, a German spy, Hans Thilo Schmidt, who supplied a lot of information about the daily Enigma settings. This all enabled the Polish Crypt Cipher Bureau to determine the nature of the Enigma itself. But that's not the end of the story, because after that, um, you had the problem of determining the daily Enigma settings. And any, any uh, cryptography method has to assume that at some point or another, those who want to listen into the messaging will get hold of the platform on which the encryption takes place. So you can't rely on the Enigma itself for the security. What you rely on is the vast number of different configurations or uh, settings known as the key uh, and in totality the key space of the enigma to provide that security and in the early 1930s the key space that is the total number of ways you could set the enigma up was about seven billion billion ways so any thoughts of some kind of brute force attack you know we'll just try configuring it one way after another, typing a bit of text and see if anything sensible comes out, that's not going to work. And so the Polish cryptographers had to come up with ways that could deduce the daily Enigma settings quickly enough for them to then um, decrypt all the communications they listened into and make sense of them. And so the cyclometer was the first ever device developed to assist in this process of daily key recovery. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't of use for a very long period of time, and this is again one of the features of um, cryptography: is that it's always a race between the cryptographers, those who want to um, converse, <coughs> message each other in private, and those who want to listen in. And the Germans always, always kept adding extra security features to the Enigma. And one of the things they did was change the method of message. Uh, settings and that meant that the cyclometer then became obsolete and so the Polish mathematicians and engineers developed um, the Polish bomber um, but ultimately that was the forerunner of something that you can go and visit at Bletchley Park which is the Turing bomb. So as a final point before um, how I hand over to Hal, when it became clear that uh, Poland was going to be invaded uh, by, by Germany um, all evidence of the Polish breaking of the Enigma had to be destroyed because if the Germans had got any sense that they were breaking into the Enigma, uh, then they would have completely started again with a, a different encryption process. And so all the cyclometers, the replica Enigmas, other de uh, the bombers, the other decryption aids that had been developed, they were all destroyed. Um, and that meant that up until very recently, the world was a world free of cyclometers. But I'm going to hand over to Hal now and he'll tell you how he managed to help change that. Thank you very much, Tim. I'll just start sharing my screen as well. Hopefully that should be coming through. So thank you very much, Tim. So um, what I'm going to do is talk us through um, what, what the how the cyclometer worked, what it was used for, and then talk us through the sort of manufacturing build of the replica cyclometer we made. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to say I think there's some good, good questions coming through, and I think one of which is how is it encode, how is the Enigma message encoded and decoded? 
I'll be just going through that now. So in order to understand uh, how the cyclometer worked, what it was used for, we need to take a step back and understand the uh, German Enigma protocol used at the time. So in the mid 1930s, uh, the German protocol necessitated the use of two keys. One is called a daily key and the second is a message key. Now this daily key was sent um, in, it said ahead of time in code books, it's predefined. A message key was, was defined by the user. So they would choose a message key at random uh, every time an operator was sending a message. Now this message key was enciphered twice. So to run through an example, as a sending operator, uh, the operator sets up the Enigma machine to the daily key. So that would say, okay, we're going to have rotors in order, say one, three, two, uh, starting settings, A, B, C, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you then choose, the operator would then choose a three letter message, choosing, uh, message, message key of his own choosing. So take for example, a random example, for instance, N, H, Z. The operate, operator would then encipher this twice. So you get the plain text, N, H, Z, N, H, Z and that will go to an encrypted message, FJA, GLK. The operator then move the rotors to NHZ and then start typing the actual message, the rest of the message. So this is just a six letter header. Now the receiving operator essentially does this in reverse, sets it up for the daily key, enters the first six, six letters that he receives, he or she receives, which would be FJA, GLK. And then if done correctly, what will come out will be NHZ, NHZ. So why did the Germans do this? Why did they put this, this message key at the beginning? Well, it, it was a, for a simple reason. They thought that this doing this message key was even further enhancing the security of the Enigma system. However, Wojewski and his colleagues noticed something about this, and it's quite a simple pattern. What you know is that the first and fourth letters of every message are the same you know that the second and fifth are the same and the third and sixth. So in our example, we know that it was NHZ. So we know that both F and G here represent the letter N. You wouldn't know the plain text, but you just know that there's a relation between F and G and equally J and L and A and K. So if we, we can dive into Rajewski's theorem now. So this double encipherment of the three letter message headings gave some crucial information away. So we take our rotor position. So when you set up the rotor, uh, the Enigma machine as per the uh, daily key, you have rotor position one, and that's essentially what we're going to deem Enigma permutation A. So that's as Tim was showing earlier. Uh, the, the 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 letters are scrambled through all the rotors, reflect, etc., and it's essentially a substitution cipher. When you press a letter, the rotors move move to a different position. You get a different permutation, a different substitution cipher. So that's why we've got A, B, C, D, etc. Now we don't know the plain text, but we do know there's a relation between them. We do know the cipher text because you can intercept it. And if what you can do is if, if you combine permutations, so if you, if you have permutation AD, which is known as a composite permutation, so if you essentially mash them together, we know there's a relation with F and G. We know that it contains F and G. Equally B and E contains the letters J and L and C and F contains the letters A and K. Now, what, what so happens, if you intercept enough messages, and it's about 80 for a given day, these composite permutations, A, D, B, E, and C, F were known. And Wyevsky's theorem is this. The product of two disjoint transpositions results in permutations consisting of pairs of equal cycle lengths. Now, don't worry too much exactly what it means. I'll, I'll, I'll go into an example what exactly that means, and also Tim will show us in the demonstration of the cyclometer as well. But what we know is that, what we need to know is that they, these are called characteristic cycles. So to show you what this looks like, we've intercepted a message here and I've just, I'm just taken off the six letter message headings. Um, there'll be a load of plain, uh, a load of ciphertext after this, but we're just looking at those six letter message headings. Also intercept a load more messages. Now, what we're gonna do is just inspect the first and fourth letters. So this composite permutation AD. What we can see is the first, the, first, the first line here, we have F and G in this relation there. We can kind of say F goes to G here. Now, we, what we need to do is look for another message, which starts with G. So then G and then jumps to W. And so we can write, you can write here F, G, W at the bottom. We need to look for another message, which starts with W, goes to D and so on. 
keep doing this until we go all the way back to F. Now, what you'll find is if you keep looking at these messages, it would just do the same thing. It'd just be a cycle. Now, that is a complete cycle. You can do the same thing. So you can do A goes to R, R goes to S, and so on and so on. And you can do this until you run through the totality of the alphabet. And this is why you need about 80, for, 80 messages for a given day to ensure you've got all these, uh, you've got all the cycles. Now, we don't really care too much about the letters inside here. What we care about are the characteristics and the length of the characteristics. That's what's critical here. Now, this encipherment, Rife's theory, showed that this double encipherment was a fatal flaw in the keying procedures adopted by the German force at the time. So what you're seeing here is a calculation of the key space um, Tim was talking about earlier, which is that 7 billion billion um, number, of, number of possible setups. Now to put that into context, um, if anyone remembers the Yellow Page book, the last time I checked there's 350,000 entries in the Yellow Pages. So that's some 20 million million Yellow Pages. That's a lot of different permutations there. What Horayevsky showed there in his theorem, which was absolutely phenomenal, um, was that the characteristic cycle lengths, so those lengths that I showed 4994 earlier, were completely independent of the plug board. Now this completely changes everything. To explain this a little bit, what it, what's happening with the plug board, the letters are changing, but those cycle lengths are not changing. Now this limits the possible rotor starting positions to just 105,456. In other words, roughly speaking, a third of a yellow page. Now this is sometimes known as, some, some, some people deem this as the theorem that won the war. This completely revolutionizes and brings such an enormous number down to something which is now big, but it's manageable. And what, what, what you find is that if these characteristic cycles and cycles are known, so if you could say we've got a big yellow page book, say, of 105,456 um, Enigma setups, these characteristics are unique in 50% of cases. So if you can find out those characteristic lengths for a given day, you can look up in the book, and in 50% of the cases, that only, that only corresponds to one rotor setup. And in 93% of cases, fewer than 10. Now, this is only possible, of course, if you have this catalogue. And how do you go about constructing a catalogue? One could use an Enigma machine. The Polish, the Polish had enig what was called Enigma doubles and essentially Enigma replicas. But it takes about 10 minutes per entry and it's very, it's very easy to make mistakes in it, um, that sort of thing. So what Wojewski and his colleagues came up with was a machine that could calculate these characteristics. And that is what the cyclometer is. It's essentially two back-to-back -back enigmas set three rotor positions apart. So the first rotor position uh, is, in, a, in essence, let's call it permutation A. Um, sorry, the first rotor system is permutation A, and the second rotor system is set three, three, three steps on ahead of that, and thus, in essence, permutation D, equally B, B E, or, or C, F, etc. We'll just say A and D for now. What the cyclone does, it takes, it's in, instead of taking about 10 minutes per entry, it takes about 30 seconds per catalog entry. And Tim will show us this later. And even though it was or clearly a lot quicker, um, I've got a quote from Rashke at the bottom as creating this catalog, so that this job here is creating the catalog, uh, took a long time, over a year, since we carried it out along with our normal work, reconstructing daily keys using the grill, which was a, uh, a, another method used at the time. Once all six card catalogs were ready, and that's six because there's, as Tim said earlier, three times, two times, one different ways of, of, of loading in uh, the three rotors. Uh, obtaining the other keys was usually a matter of 10 to 20 minutes. It's absolutely outstanding. And so this is what the cyclometer looks like. As Tim was saying, the, um, in, it, it's speculated that in 1939, it, that's all existence of the cyclometer is destroyed, absolutely everything, any cyclometer, any documentation. The drawing on the left hand side is pretty much the only blueprint, if you like, of what it looks like. And that's drawn by Rewski himself in his memoirs. The, uh, the sort of theoretical understanding of how the cyclometer works is fairly well known, but this, this sort of mechanical side isn't very well known. What we can see here on the right hand side is, is, is a sort of a schematic diagram. So we've got that first rotor system and the second rotor system three steps ahead. And what the cyclometer has essentially 20, those 26 letters, the alphabet with 26 bowls. If you flick a switch, 
what's essentially happening is it's drawing the battery um, in, into series with the bulb. So if you see an example on the right, it's flick switch A. Now the current runs through bulb A, goes through the first rotor system, it's scrambled through there, representing permutation A, goes back through the lamp board, back, um, and then back through the second rotor system, and it might keep bouncing, it might keep bouncing back and forth, it might, it might not. So that's why they always come in pairs of equal length, because it's doing this back and forth, essentially. Now, so this is all the theory, and this is what the cyclometer was and what it was used for. So what we, at this point, it, we, we want to talk about how the cy what the cyclometer replica looks like and, and how we started there. Now, in, in terms of recreating a cyclometer, one can approach it in different ways. You can approach it from a software way, a hardware way, a bit of a hybrid. Um, but what we wanted to do is go down the hard hardware route and the purely the hardware route. And again, you can approach that in different ways. You can make it with modern materials, old materials. And what we want to do is try to make the replica as close as we possibly could, um, as close to the original as, as, as we could really. And it, it's all somewhat conjecture um, as there's no documentation, but really it's trying to use the materials that, were, that we know we used at the time, that sort of thing, as much as possible at least. So the first step in, in recreating a replica cyclometer is using a bit of software. What we need to do is, is something to make sure that we can validate the machine at the end and also question our understanding. So it created a software emulator, which does what the cyclometer job, which basically creates the 105,456 different catalog entries, if you like. And this is a snapshot of, of, of kind of what it looks like. So you can see for each rotor star position, you've got those characteristic cycle lengths went through various design stages, so lots of um, sort of putting lots of um, wiring diagrams, making sure it works, going through the CAD diagrams. And it's just to show on the right hand side, the top right hand side, you can see a, a is actually somewhat simplified explode the diagram of a rotor. And they're the real core of a uh, of the cyclometer as there are six in them, two, two different rotor systems. Went through other various um, CAD designs. So here's, here's the rotor holding system. So. Uh, the cyclometer we do know was made in the AVA factory, which is the same factory um, that was the Polish used to make the Enigma doubles. Uh, and therefore it's kind of speculated that they probably use the same parts. And further cadding up the whole thing. So we've got the, the entire replica um, um, all put together. Now, the, as I mentioned, the, the, the true core of the cyclometer, the road is reflected. And you can see, you can get a taste for the complexity um, in, in that exploded diagram. And we wanted to go down the, the original routes, what it, what it was as close to originally as possibly could get. And so what we did, we, we thought about, oh, we, we could possibly make these, but it would be a phenomenal effort. So what we ended up doing was, was ordering and, and purchasing these, these parts, these rotors from a specialist machinist in Germany. And the quality is absolutely outstanding. What looks like just a sort of silver silver metal there is, um, is a material called Zamac and it's centrifugally die cast. The index, uh, the letter ring is made from epoxy resin and the, the black parts here you can see are made from Bakelite uh, and the pins pins and pads are made from brass and inset into the Bakelite, et cetera. It's, it's, it's truly outstanding. And even inside, it's not just wired up with a PCB or something, it's exactly as it was done before. This is the back of a, of a reflector um, so you can see all the wires in the back um, linking up the two pins, scrambling the latters. Uh, and they're not just any old wires, they're solid core wires covered in silk coating. Now, the next thing, after you've got the rotors, we want to make the, the, the parts in which those rotors sit. So I went through um, creating the rotor racks, and this is where the, work, the workshop did an actually fantastic job and some actually like really, really fiddly parts. Um, so there's many, many thanks for that. And now you get an idea of, of, of the rotors sitting in a rack. Do you start to see it coming together? The next part of the, um, the next key part of the cyclometer is the lamp board. So it's got 26 bulbs, 26 switches. Um, and again, why these all by hand using silk covered wiring and cable lace them together. You can see the white, the white cable lacing with um, uh, linen that being pulled through wax. And you get a bit of an idea, you can see here that the mass of wires coming out of the, the lamp board, um, which will have to be done, put, put together by hand. You get an idea here, the sort of the, the number of wires um, going around. And it was a, 
it was a heart stopping moment when I um, finally sold it all together and tested it, I have to say. <laughs> Um, so there's one, there's a very interesting thing. There's one, there's one very small thing uh, Rayevsky mentions in his memoirs, and this is the, this is what uh, the front panel was made from a material called ebonite. Now it's a, it's essentially a very hard, well vulcanized rubber, and you can see this sort of dirty looking thing on the left hand side. And we went to quite a lot of length to source this from, um, from Germany again. You can see on the right hand side this being milled in the, in the workshop. And after you polish it up, uh, had had it uh, engraved and and letters filled with white wax. And now, just to take you through some of the uh, uh, the photos of the finished replica before I hand over to Tim for a demonstration. So you can see here, this is the replica all, all put together with the ebonite panel on the front and the twenty six bulbs, letters, etc. And an interesting thing on this view is, is the rheostat. And, and I think Tim will probably explain when he's using it as well. But essentially, if you remember the, sch the schematic diagram, um, the, the, the bulbs and letters are all in series. And therefore, and because they're old fashioned filament bulbs, if, um, if you've just got a cycle length of two, for instance, you've got a risk of those bulbs blowing. So you need a rheostat, a, a, a variable resistance in essence. Uh, in series to make sure that you can wind the resistance up and down to ensure that doesn't happen. It's another photo um, of, the, of the replica and you can see the, the letters um, in, the, in the window. So the right hand side system set three steps ahead of that on the left. This is with the, the rotor lid open so you get a bit of it. You can see the sort of inside. And I always like to flash this one up, which is uh, the original, the, the line drawing from Wojewski against the replica, which is it's very nice to see. Uh, just a nice close up or two of, of the of the rotors and inside so you can see the input commutator um, and now you can see just hidden underneath here the, the system that holds the rotors in place. This is the reflector, uh, you see the reflector here and then the rotors in position and finally um, the the just the, the the reflector not engaged at the moment so you can see all the all the pins sticking out there. And it's at this point I want to hand back to Tim to give a live demonstration of the cyclometer replica. Thank you very much for that, Hal. Um, I don't know whether you can, if whether there's a way of maximizing this on the screen um, for the viewers whether that would work better if you dismiss your um, stop video or something, Hal. Oh, good idea, I'll try that. You try that. Okay, that's better. Yeah, thank you ever so much, Hal. That, that's, um, that's not an easy thing to try and explain to people. So I've got the uh, much easier job. Um, I've got the cyclometer here at home with me. So we're in Flax Studios here, where um, I've attached the webcam with some blue tack, so it's all high tech. And now we're looking down on top of the cyclometer that Hal was showing all those photos of. And so I've set the cyclometer to some initial position. So the left hand rotor system, I hope you can see, is set to AAA. And then the right hand rotor system set to AAD, which is three possession positions ahead of the left hand system. Um, Hal has shown you some photos of the cyclometer. So but just a quick look under the bonnet here, you can see uh, the two sets of three rotors. There's the input commutator. There's the reflector, which as Hal pointed out, has this mechanism so you can um, disengage it. And that would enable you to pull out the three rotors and reorder them on the shafts um, to create catalogs for the six different rotor orderings. So if you were creating this catalog, and you were working sort of logically, I guess you'd set everything up to AAA and AAD, and then you'd be finding the cycle lengths for the composite permutations corresponding to the position AAA. And then what you do is you'd press one of these um, switches, let's say uh, letter A, and what you'd be asking the question is, which pair of cycle lengths does the letter A belong to? And so when you press this down, some bulbs would light up. Now it's quite hard to see this, um, but the rear stat helps. And as Hal has explained, what's happened here is if you count these bulbs, I'm not gonna, I, I wrote them all down before to make things a bit easier. 
18 of these bulbs have lit up, which means we have a pair of nine cycles. Now they're lighting up, they're lighting up quite dimly because in effect, we've got 18 of these bulbs connected across in series across the same voltage supply. So the rear stat would enable you to turn things up a bit to make it all a bit easier to see what had lit up. But the operation would always require you to put the rear stat back to maximum because you never knew what was coming next. And so the operator would look at the bulbs and think, well, oh, letter G hasn't lit up yet. So next time I'll turn this switch off with all of the rear stat, all the resistors in series, in case you've got a pair of unit cycles, in which case you've only got two bulbs connected across the voltage supply, uh, and that would just blow them up. Um, then you can flick that on. And um, if you count these bulbs up, then there's eight of them that have lit up, and that's a pair of four cycles. And so what that means is that we had 18 bulbs lighting up originally. Now we've got another eight. All 26 bulbs have lit up at some point. And so we know the characteristic cycle is nine, four. Always has, up, has to add up to 13. Um, so that's one example of a position. Um, AAC is another one I thought was quite interesting. So AAC, AAF. Um, and in this one, you probably can't see that the bulbs have lit up. Um, and <clears throat> this would be joy to the cyclometer, the cataloger using the cyclometer, because all the bulbs have lit up except these two. So immediately what you know is you've got a 24, which gives you a pair of 12 cycles and then a pair of unit cycles here. So you've got to remember to put all that resistance back in place because I know that when I press either S or T, these two are going to be the only bulbs connected in series across the batteries that supply this thing. And if I'd not forgot, if I'd not remembered to put all the resistance back in series, that would have certainly blown those bulbs. So the cyclometer, you can see it just takes a matter of seconds to determine the cycle lengths when they're there's only say a couple of them. Um, I'll show you a, a final um, demonstration so we get time to answer a few questions, um, which is the sort of thing where um, I guess if you were doing this on a regular basis, you'd get very good at this sort of thing. But it's a bit like playing one of those sort of games with kids when um, you, you turn up a lot of cards with pictures on them and then you turn them then, then your child sort of, I don't know, takes a couple away and then you turn around and you've got to try and remember which, which ones are missing. And your child sort of laughs at you because you can't remember any of them. And that, that's what this is a bit like. So in this position, um, I do this and I notice that one, two, three, four, five, six, I've written it down, so I don't know why I'm doing that. 14 bulbs have lit up. So that's a pair of seven cycles. So even I can remember that, let's say the letter D, that's not lit up yet. So I can do that. And then one, two, three, four, six bulbs are lit up. So that means we've had a pair of seven cycles, a pair of three cycles. So that adds up to 20. And so there's something that hasn't, well, there might be some other cycles in there. Um, yeah. I should have written this down. It might be that one. No, that was part of that one. But anyway, um, I can't remember which letter I now have to uh, press down. So I'm guessing the cyclometer operators would have developed a memory that was very good in terms of remembering which bulbs hadn't lit up as they were doing this uh, and therefore which switches to try. But, but what you had to do was make sure at some point all bulbs have lit up and make a note of the uh, total number in each case, and then you've got the characteristic cycles that you would then put into the catalogue uh, for that particular rotor uh, configuration. And so as Hal explained, you, the uh, Cypher Bureau would know the date, would know from all the Enigma traffic what the characteristic cycles were, and it was just a simple matter of looking them up in the catalogue 
and that would limit the key space down to perhaps two or three different sets of rotor positions, which they could then um, try out. Um, so, yeah, that's it for the psychometer demonstration. So it looks like we've got some some very good questions in in the chat. So thank you very much, everyone, for um, for offering a question. Um, there's an interesting one here, which is coming from Paul Paul McGuire, which says, um, "How many um, how many psychometers have you manufactured? Is that more than one? Have we got a backup?" <laughs> Tim, I don't know if you want to jump yeah. on that one. Uh, well, it took a it was very difficult just to manufacture one. Something that I think probably both of us now regret is that we didn't source, you know, double the number of rotors and reflectors because we outsourced those. Um, and it, because we've been asked on a number of occasions, can we build more of these replicas? And the answer is we could, but it would be very expensive. But all that initial design work, um, all that overhead, we still have that. So we could do it a lot quicker. Um, but it would be very difficult to source all those components again. Do you want to add to that at all, Hal? Yeah, it, it's exactly that. I think because of the nature of the machine, it's while one can use sort of modern day CNC technology to an extent, it still um, requires very bespoke manufacturing and therefore takes up lots of time. Um, and and that, yeah, most parts have to be done. Like, like, for example, all the wiring that's done by hand, that take days to do that. And, and if there's a mistake, it takes days to debug it and test it. Uh, it's not like a PCB or something which is printed and you can just mass produce it. Um, so that, that, yeah, it, it takes a very long time to do. So here's a question from Gillian Dawson for you, Hal. In February, 1942, um, there were, times four rotors were introduced by the Germans. That was for the naval network, wasn't it? Would the cyclometer still have worked for four rotors? Yes, so um, the cyclometer, unfortunately what happened, I can't remember off the top of my head the exact year now. I think it was about 1936 or seven, I believe. Um, the, German the Germans changed the protocol. So at first, so, what, so to go rewind a bit from that, so that the Polish made the, the catalog and at that time it was using reflector A. They, the Germans then ch changed the reflector to reflector B and the, the, po the Polish had to redo the entire catalog. After that point, so it was working at that point, but after then the Germans then changed the protocol so it no longer had a double E ciphered message key. And so prior to the war, prior to the Second World War, sorry, um, that the cyclometer was, was, was no longer uh, a method. Okay, here's a question. Did Turing know all about the Polish cyclometer or did he work independently? When was the Polish contribution first known about? Um, yes, Turing did know about a lot of the Polish methods that were used because um, he met with um, some of the, well, Marian Rieski in particular, and they uh, gave Turing a lot of information. So Bletchley Park certainly benefited a great deal from um, the, the, the work of the Polish um, Cypher Bureau, certainly. And Sandeep Taylor, how would the operator know the cycle length through just the rear stat before actually using the machine? Do you want to do that one? We'll take it in turns, eh? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I think that was um, what you, 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 the operator wouldn't know what it was prior to using it, but what you'd have to do is always ensure that you set the rear stat to the, the highest resistance and therefore uh, the least the, the least voltage would run through the bulbs that makes sense. So when you turned it on, if it happened to be a pair um, pair of length 13, i.e. 26 bulbs light up, uh, it'd be very dim. You wouldn't really see it. You'd have to wind the rheostat, um, wind the rheostat round such that you can see it. However, if, if the rheostat was um, at the tightest resistance and you, and you flipped it and you only had a, a cycle length of, of, of a, a pair of one, so you've got two bulbs lighting up, you wouldn't need to do anything at that point because they'd all be already be very bright. And Jerry McCarthy has said it is possible that some of the machines were actually buried during their escape from Poland to France. Um, OK, that's more of a statement than a question, but um, I've recently read a book that made that same speculation that rather than destroying um, the, the cyclometers, the Zergalski sheets, the bombers and all the notes they would have made and so on, the replica enigmas, that they were indeed buried. But um, I don't know if there's any evidence to prove that one way or the other. 
And so no one, as far as I'm aware, has ever found them. So I think to all intents and purposes, they're probably as good as being destroyed. But who knows, someone with a metal detector one of these days might prove that they were buried. Um, Hugo Tyson, so you count the lit bulbs to get cycle length and you try to switch for one that didn't like, get another and so on. Yep, that's exactly right. And that's why for the cycle lengths where you've got a pair of 13s, that was dead easy. But when you've got some of these cycles are quite complex, you might find three or four unit cycles and a couple of threes and, and then it was a, a memory game. Um, do you want to have a go at this one, Hal? Qan Shay. Why does a second uh, right hand set of rotors have to be exactly three positions ahead of the first rotor system? Yes, so that goes back to essentially, you know that the, for example, we know that the first and fourth letters have that relation and that the difference between the three, three rotor positions and equally second and fifth and third and sixth. So if you remember um, earlier on and thought they had the sort of permutation A and permutation D, that's three steps apart. So that's why it's exactly three, three positions ahead of the first rotor, uh, first rotor system, sorry. Right, and we've received the hook from our colleagues in development. We were told that that was the last question that we've got time for. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Hal, and also the audience for taking part in this webinar and uh, for sending in your questions. We look forward to seeing you back in college soon as it's possible. Um, so once again, thank you ever so much for attending and it's goodbye from me and... Goodbye from me as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.